Good afternoon, uh, everybody. So we are going to get started right on time. I know people are still joining the WebEx meeting, but we thought in the interest of time we, we'd start the meeting. So uh, good afternoon. My name is Melanie Carr. I'm Head of Stakeholders and Communication Division here at the EMA. And it's my pleasure to open this event and welcome all the participants, so the speakers, the panelists, the external participants, both those who've joined in the virtual meeting room and also to everyone who is watching the live broadcast. And today is not only the last day of February, it's Rare Disease Day. And as 2024 is a leap year, um, sorry, as 20, uh, 29th of February occurs only once every four years, it's a rare event in our calendar. And I think it's particularly fitting that we're, we're celebrating uh, rare medicines today. So we've organized the webinar not only to mark Rare Disease Day, but also to talk about orphan designation and the benefits it brings to developers and patients, and also to provide you with an opportunity to ask our panel of regulatory experts any question that you may have. Now, I was privileged enough, um, and I'm also old enough, to have been involved in the EU orphan legislation at the beginning. So back in 2000, almost a quarter of a century ago, when we inf implemented orphan medicines legislation in the EU and established the Committee for Orphan Medicinal Products and also the process for orphan designation. And so much has been achieved since those early days, thanks to the dedicated work of the colleagues in the committee and across the network and to the very close collaboration that we have with stakeholders. And patients and healthcare professionals have been involved front and centre in the orphan story from the start. COMP was the first committee at EMA to have patient reps as full members. And the truly positive impact was apparent from day one and continues to be. So today, you'll hear from our head of our orphan medicines office, Christina Larson, on what's been achieved over the past two decades and what support is on offer to, to developers. We'll also hear from Virginie Iver from Eurodis, who will provide the patient's perspective from someone who's been involved in the comp firsthand also for many years. I'll then introduce our panel of experts and open the floor for Q&A and discussion. During the meeting, we'll be using Slido, uh, and we'll be giving you the, the code to, to sign on and the passcode, and you can share your questions with us. I'm delighted to say that we had a good um, number of participants register for the meeting. Um, I hope the connection is working well for all of you. The meeting is also being recorded and broadcast live. And if anyone has a problem connecting to the WebEx, please do feel free to follow the live broadcast. So without any further delay, I'm going to pass the floor to Christina Larson to kick off the presentations. Over to you, Christina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie. And I'm so pleased that uh, we are doing this on Rare Disease Day. Um, I do have a couple of slides that uh, you should very soon be able to see. But as Melanie was mentioning, it's actually quite some time since uh, their orphan legislation came into place. Uh, and uh, things looked a bit different back then. My telephone was definitely much smaller. Although I have to say, I would like it to be small again. I kind of like that. Um, I was in no WhatsApp group whatsoever. Could have been a relief, actually. If someone would have said CRISPR, I'm sure that I would have thought that that was some kind of new delicacy that would have come to the market. And one thing that I really almost forgot was that, that the European Union was much smaller back then. And Current, you know, over the years, uh, we have expanded quite substantially. So there are a lot of changes. And if we go to the next slide, you already got the sneak peek that in the orphan office, actually, uh, and probably at the agency as a whole, it also looked a bit different. So back in 2000, when we received applications for orphan designations, they came in the paper format, so big folders. Um, that we had on our desks. We gradually decided that that was a bit bulky and then went for a CD instead. And we didn't have the paper versions. Today, however, all designations uh, and actually all scientific advice procedures or prime procedures are 
uh, done via our portal instead. So there's definitely been a lot of uh, difference over the years um, um, with regards to the procedure. Now I'm going to go into a couple of very more regulatory uh, slides and uh, explain a little bit about the orphan regulation to just set the scene. So the designation, um, well, the designation and the regulation stems from 2000. And uh, it's based on the fact that we want to have orphan or products for very rare diseases. Um, and their criteria are set out. And the rarity particularly says that the medicinal condition should not affect more than 5 in 10,000 people in the European community. Uh, there is also a possibility to have an orphan designation based on um, incentives. Now, <clears throat> it is also possible, as I mentioned, to have a designation not based on rarity, but based on the unlikeliness of a return of investment. But I have to say that this is a criteria that hardly ever used. Now, the designation is also given to conditions that are life-threatening and uh, or chronically uh, debilitating. And which is quite special for the regulation in Europe is that if there are methods approved, then the applicant for a new orphan designation has to show that the new product can bring a significant benefit to the patient. Right, so we were talking um, orphan designation and what are the benefits with regards to incentive if you have an orphan designation. So um, I mentioned that there are fee reductions and exemptions specifically for small and medium-sized enterprises. Now, we guess that the main incentive is the 10-year market exclusivity, which can even be expanded with another two years if you have a pediatric investigational plan that has been agreed um, and fulfilled. And what does this exclusivity give? It is not, as I sometimes say, some sort of monopoly on the market, but it does protect against similar medicinal products which are aimed for the same condition as the product already approved on the market. There are some derogations uh, for the similarity assessment. Um, the original sponsor can consent to the new product coming on the market. There could be a very much a lack of supply, or you could show that the new product is actually clinically superior. And uh, then, of course, there are quite a lot of incentives throughout development. For example, we have the protocol assistance with a reduced fee. Uh, and also there is, of course, the community marketing authorization that's available for a lot of uh, the conditions right now, anyway, within rare diseases. Um, so there are several incentives and there are also usually national incentives uh, within uh, uh, each member state. And as you may hear a little bit later as well from one of our panelists, there is a possibility to possibly get some uh, EU grants um, if you have an orphan designation. Next slide, please. Now, what does it look like then throughout uh, the development of a medicinal product uh, for rare diseases? So top line there, we have, well, maybe the ideal development, uh, uh, the phase Three, there may not always actually take place if you have a very rare disease, so, and it may be sort of merged instead. Um, however, this slide is more to sort of outline at what stage you can engage on various procedures with the agency. And there you see the orphan designation procedure, which can take place at a very early stage. Designation can be given based only on non-clinical data, uh, and it's not always needed to have clinical data. So you can come at a very early stage for designation. However, there should be some data to support uh, what we call a medical plausibility. So some basis for assuming that this product could actually be used in, in humans. And of course, you will also be able to have to show the significant benefit of the product if there are the pro or, or products authorized and therefore you may have to have a little bit of information on how the product will work. Now, the orphan designation can be, give, be given up until the marketing authorization procedure. Uh, 
And then you have a maintenance review of orphan status. So the Committee of Orphan Medicinal Products will review the criteria when a product comes for marketing authorization to establish that the product actually should benefit for th from the orphan incentives. And on this slide, you also see uh, scientific advice protocol assistance, which can be given at sort of any stage of development. Uh, the, I've mentioned the pediatric investigational plan because that's important uh, whilst you've started your development as well, but is a little bit later as well. And of course, the benefit risk assessment and pharmacovigilance phase. So next slide, please. I also wanted to mention that our website holds so much information. It may sometimes be a little bit difficult to find everything, but we do communicate on a lot of things. So we communicate on all our designations. Now we have a listing where you can actually filter, download everything. So this is sort of available uh, via the IRIS portal. We have guidance documents, the Q&A documents. All the minutes of the Committee of All for Medicinal Products are published and so are the agendas. So there's information there on the decisions taken. And of course, there's a lot of scientific publications as well, which we have in the uh, public domain, but also usually linked on our website. And one thing that I think is really important is that uh, since a couple of years back, uh, we also publish the orphan maintenance assessment report. So just like for any other benefit risk assessment, the assessment done by the Committee of Orphan Medicinal Product at Marketing Authorization is made public with the decision. Next slide, please. This slides that will become available to you, so we'll publish it. And the useful thing is then that this blue uh, text is actually links because it could be useful for you to be able to click on and see what other things uh, um, the agency can do at an early stage. So we have uh, the prime designation procedure. Also very early, you can have innovation task force meetings. Um, and uh, together with the scientific advice protocol assistance, there's also qualification advice and opinion. I won't dwell on this anymore because I really want us to have uh, a lot of time for questions. So if we continue to the next slide, please. I did want to mention specifically the protocol assistance or scientific advice is called protocol assistance if you have an orphan designation. And this is given by the scientific advice working party. I already mentioned it can be given at the very early stage and more or less on any type of question. Um, how to manufacture, so the, the quality aspect of it, but also early stage on um, non-clinical development, you know, what type of data do you need for an, a marketing authorization? Maybe most importantly, and we really encourage this discussion, sort of how do you do the clinical studies in, to ensure, and maybe that's specifically important for authors, that you actually capture data that we can use for assessment at the marketing authorization stage. Because there are very few patients, so we need to ensure that those patients are uh, treated in the very best way and the data can actually be used in the end. Next slide, please. So there are several contact points and Virginie also mentioned this. Uh, I specifically here wanted to mention that uh, if you are a patient representative, we have a special uh, colleagues engaging with patients and Maria Mavis is here in the panel today as well for academia as well. And we are lucky to have the academia liaison officer also uh, in the panel today. The SME office is obviously hugely important uh, uh, and uh, we don't have anyone there today, but we are obviously able to answer questions if there is any questions about SME. Also, Melanie has a big uh, um, experience in the SME office. So. So these are links and uh, very, very useful contact points. And then just the last thing, I started out saying, for those who were here in the beginning, that there are a lot of changes since the beginning of uh, the orphan regulation. However, there are some things that haven't changed. Now, our devotion to support development of rare diseases and, you know, our trying to work with stakeholders to improve your experience and to... Uh, improve the interactions. I think that's that stayed the same over the years and we really try and, and uh, continue to improve on this all the time as well. 
And a few points to remember, and we'll probably come back on that. It is important with early interaction with the agency because this gives you the benefit of an early designation, the possibilities, some incentives to ask for protocol assistance or indeed scientific advice. And also to, in the end, you know, you could always contact us. You can contact me, my colleagues, uh, anyone actually you hear about today here. Uh, and we have these uh, contact points and you will always be directed to the person most suitable to help you. So I'll finish there because I really hope we'll have a lot of questions. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Like Melanie was saying in our introduction, I'm Virginie Iver. I'm uh, Eurodis Therapeutic Development Director. And I can see in the chat that uh, you can hear me. So that's very uh, good. <laughs> that's perfect. So first of all, I just wanted to uh, thank the EMA to have this webinar, which I hope we'll, uh, we will manage to uh, get to the full extent because that will be very interesting. Uh, and indeed, uh, it's uh, on top of everything, it's very, very, very good. And we are very grateful to have this webinar organized on the Rare Disease Day, which is today, as Melanie was saying. If you click on the next, uh, Monica, please. Um, yeah, thank you. Just to start with a warm welcome from the Committee of Often Medicinal Product, who uh, was uh, raising hands uh, in, um, the celebration of the Rare Disease Day. And then I will uh, just start this presentation with uh, a bit of a like highlight of what is Rare Disease Day. If you uh, can go next, please. So Rare Disease Day, thank you, is um, a global movement, first of all. Uh, it's taking place on the uh, last day of February every year. This year, it was a very special year with this uh, a very special day of the nine, uh, 29th. And it's actually a movement that has uh, really uh, been started 16 uh, years ago, started in, 20, in 2008. And it, like I was saying, it's a global movement gathering uh, the rare disease community from over uh, 100 countries. We have had new countries joining us for this campaign this year, like the Rwanda. So it's increasing. It's really uh, about awareness um, raising for Rare Disease Day. We have uh, materials, we have videos, we have events organized all over uh, the world. And I'm sure you have already spotted the events that are happening in your country and around you. So, um, the um, this this day this uh, this uh, this global campaign has been uh, re coordinated by uh, the uh, Rare Disease Patient Organization, by Eurodis, by Rare Disease International, and by all the national alliance over the the world. So uh, yeah, I'm calling in today basically from uh, the Paris uh, office of Eurodis. Uh, we are located on the rare disease platform and uh, today is really a big day. There is a lot of effervescence around me for this special day. Uh, then I will uh, show uh, you um, a few additional uh, points uh, that will fully complement the presentation of C Christina. So if you go next, Monica, thank you. I have a few slides that are really pertaining to rare disease development and why and how it is important for the patients. And then I have a few on patient engagement and how the patient community has and is still um, interacting uh, with the EMA on a regular basis. And then I have a few considerations for uh, the audience, both in terms of the question that we receive from the patients and also from what we are really expecting from uh, the developers that are operating in this rare disease field. So to start with this uh, rare disease development, why it is so important for us, and I mean, you, there is no need for why, but it is very important for the person living with rare disease. And at Eurodis, we have um, uh, conducted this foresight study where 2030, a few years ago. This was the opportunity to really um, set and convey some policy recommendation. And this has also been the opportunity for us to refine our objective as a, a umbrella of patient organization. And as you can see here on this slide, we have a six priority areas that came uh, really out of the Rare 2030 uh, studies. And uh, um, one of them, if you want to 
click, Monica, thank you. That's the one that is the last on the slide, but uh, by no means uh, the last uh, in our mind. It's about development and availability, accessibility and affordability of treatment, particularly transformative or curative therapy. And we set for ourselves the goal of IRDIRC, the International Rare Disease Consortium, of uh, aiming at uh, 1,000 new therapies within 10 years. So that's just to set the scene. And if we go on the next slide, you can see that I'm sure Christina will show you a lot of um, uh, figures and we'll talk about all the benefits. And we, there have been a lot of benefits of the effort put in Europe uh, to the rare disease uh, development. Uh, we have seen a very uh, important uh, improvement thanks to the orphan drug regulation, but still now we are today in 2024. We uh, know that out of the six or 8,000 rare diseases, depending on how uh, you count, basically not more than 500 have a therapy. If you click on the next, uh, please Monica. We know also that the development has been a bit uneven when it's about uh, looking at all the uh, different rare diseases. On these uh, slides, what you can see is that in terms of uh, spreading of the rare diseases, most of the uh, rare diseases are very rare with a prevalence uh, less than one out of uh, uh, 100,000. Uh, but however, most of the development that we have seen coming in during the last 20 uh, years were mostly dedicated to the most prevalent of the rare disease. So just to say that there are still a lot to do, and we are very grateful to see that we are over 300 uh, participants today because it uh, shows that you have high interest in moving uh, this uh, forward. If you can just go on the next slide, I just wanted to share with you and take the opportunity of today's webinar, a tool that we have developed, this and other uh, stakeholders from very various um, um, settings to help the developer, to help different types of developer, all types of developer to navigate the rare disease environment. So the idea was really to identify what are the specificity in terms of regulatory initiative, in terms of tools, in terms of uh, principle, what are really um, the different building blocks which are composing this uh, guidebook that can be activated, that can be used in order to uh, develop more and better uh, alternative for uh, treatment of rare diseases. The paper that you see on the left of the slides is unfortunately under paywall, but all the rest, all the material, so basically the content of the orphan drug guidebook is available to anyone online. Here you have the address of the website where you have information on traditional orphan drug development, but also on repurposing. And the second um, link is a tutorial on how to use this guidebook and also to answer several uh, questions. On the next slide, I'm going a bit to the patient engagement side of things with this nice uh, scheme representing the key milestone of the interaction of the EMA with the patient and consumer. And if you want to click maybe, I think three times, I just wanted to uh, re-emphasize and highlight the really um, very uh, strong pioneering uh, effect of uh, the uh, rare disease and the orphan drug uh, in uh, the interaction between the patient and the EMA. So as Melanie was mentioning in our introduction, indeed the first committee uh, who was set up in, uh, 20, in uh, 2000, the Committee for Orphan Medicinal Product, was the first to have patients as full member with full voting rights. So the same voting right than uh, um, each of the member states representative. Uh, and then I see that questions are coming in, but I will take them afterwards. Uh, then we have a very important also pioneering effect in the sense that uh, since uh, 2005, patients were invited by the EMA in scientific advice discussion with the sponsor for orphan medicine, medicine the so-called protocol assistance procedure. And this has then been extended to all medicine a few years after. Uh, but it, it really all started with uh, the rare disease field. And now a third um, 
element. So type of interaction that is uh, more recent but very uh, important is this CHMP early contact with patient and healthcare professional organization. We can come back to that later in the Q&A. That's really a way for patients to weight in the decision in terms of benefit risk and um, that's a very good uh, way for uh, red, the rare disease community to really provide insight into a disease that might not be so known. Um, then on the next slide, Thank you. Here, just to re-emphasize as well the really good collaboration between Neurodis and our networks with the EMA. So we have started to work with the three patient representatives that are uh, nominated on the Committee for Health and Medicinal Products since the beginning. Our uh, CEO was one of the one of them, and also uh, the first vice chair of the committee. So there, it's a long-standing collaboration a long-standing collaboration as well in terms of uh, collaborating with the EMA for identifying people, uh, person living with rare disease for this protocol assistance uh, dossier that I mentioned previously, but also for other type of activity such as the scientific advice group, such as oral hearings, such as participating to different consultations. And here, those two points are about involving individual patients. And then the last one uh, is this, um, in this context of the CHMP early contact, it's about involving the patient organization, getting the knowledge of patient organization, uh, gathering uh, their input and providing it to uh, the decision making process. On the next slide, please. Thank you. Here, I wanted to give you a flavor of what type of question we do receive at Eurodis, what kind, type of questions are coming from our members, but also are coming from patients that are simply looking for information. So one of the two basically main general questions are often how to get in touch with the regulators, how to get in touch with the European Medicine Agency. So that's where we are also um, explaining uh, the type of interaction, that what is protocol assistance, what is the HMP early contact, and many others. We do that as well with uh, colleagues from the EMA who are contributing to our trainings. The second uh, overarching question is, how do I deal with competing interests? So if I'm, for example, um, collaborating with uh, pharmaceutical companies, am I able to go uh, and uh, speak with the regulator and all uh, sort of... Um, question uh, in this area. Here we have the EMA policy on competing interest. We also have recommendation from an um, EU-funded project which was called Paradigm and these are all very helpful not only for the patient but also for the stakeholders uh, in, a, in order to uh, know what are the rules uh, and then to make informed decision. And then in terms of maybe more specific and more tricky question, we have often the question on what do I do as a patient when I know that a product got a marketing authorization from the uh, US agency, from the FDA, and am I able to contribute to discussion now at the EMA? How can I share information with the regulators when sometimes there are already several products in the pipeline and I want to give additional information in, uh, on maybe how uh, one is adding value compared to the other, also when there are already several products uh, on the market. And here, for example, that's where input from patient is interesting in the assessment of significant benefit that was uh, mentioned in Christina's uh, presentation. And then uh, again, other type of question that um, really are proven to be quite difficult sometimes to answer especially how to deal with situations where all the clinical programs have failed or have been stopped, because then there is no product actually going through the EMA, but as a patient, you uh, might want to still have uh, your say and do something to change the situation. And this is very much correlated to the last question on how can I contribute on updating guidelines for a specific rare disease and also in this way helping to raise basically the general knowledge and helping to set standards for the development in this particular area. Uh, and then the last slide, and uh, after that, I will leave, uh, give the floor back to Christina. Uh, here it's a last plea from Eurodis. What we uh, need from the developer in the rare disease field 
So I've already mentioned uh, in a previous slide, but we really need investment in ultra rare disease and in rare disease that are currently with no therapeutic options, because we really need someone to be uh, starting there and to be looking for um, uh, therapeutic options. We also need to uh, keep investing in rare disease with therapeutic option because there are still uh, unmet needs that are remaining in most of the disease. And there are also treatments, for example, that have been uh, approved for third line treatment, which will benefit patients in uh, first line treatment. And that's the case often with rare cancer. So we still need research to uh, progress on this uh, area. And finally, my last word will be that uh, we still need investment in, in Europe. We still want to promote the fact that Europe is an attractive environment for uh, rare disease development. And we uh, would like to really re-emphasize the need for uh, the developer to anticipate on all the development paths, not only on the regulatory aspect, but also on the access requirements and thinking very early uh, to interaction with the HTA body and to interaction with the payers. And with that, I think I'm reaching my last slide and I thank you very much. I remain with you for uh, the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina. And thank you again, Virginie. And I'm glad to, to see that the, the technical connection is working well from our side. Um, so I'd now like to open the floor to participants who've joined us here in the virtual WebEx room. Um, so we have citizens, patients, carers, consumers, healthcare professionals, pharmaceutical industry and academics represented. Um, those of you in the WebEx room, you're welcome to raise your hand, to take the microphone, uh, raise your question or comment. Please give your name and affiliation when doing so, and please you know, feel free to turn on your camera to make it more interactive. In addition, uh, for the participants who want to put um, comments in writing, you can use the chat. We also have um, a Slido uh, running, uh, which will give you the, the passcode for shortly. And you're welcome to send your questions on Slido. Um, in addition, we see, receive some written questions prior to the, the meeting. And I have those and I can read those out during the Q&A as well and the panelists can address them. So we have an excellent group of panelists um, here today to answer your questions. Their names are on the slides and I'm going to give the floor to each of them to briefly introduce themselves. And we're going to start with Violetta. Thank you very much, Melanie. Good morning or good afternoon to all participants in this webinar. Very happy to see so many people interested in the topic. I'm the chair of the Committee for Orphan Medicinal Products and I will be happy to answer any questions as indicated on the screen, mainly on the procedure, on the content, on the scientific aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Violetta. Theodore, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. So my name is uh, Theodor Framke. I work since uh, 2020 at the agency as a second national expert, and I have a background in um, biostatistics. Thank you. Thank you, Theodor. Iordanis? Good afternoon, everyone. Iordanis Gravan is the head of the Scientific Advice Office, and a pleasure to uh, be here today and to answer any questions on protocol assistance and patient engagement and scientific advice related to uh, orphan drugs specifically or generally. Thank you, Jordanis. Maria? Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. My name is Maria Mavris and I am patient liaison in the public and stakeholder engagement department, ensuring the patient voice is uh, included all along the medicine's regulatory life cycle. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And we have Maribel. Good afternoon, everyone. Maribel Rico Salas. I am the academia liaison. I am here to answer any questions regarding um, how academic researchers and developers uh, uh, have uh, can interact with the agency in a very uh, well-tailored uh, way for, to make things easier for them. So any questions regarding academic development, uh, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you. And last by no means least, Ellen in the European Commission. Thank you. Indeed, I'm Hélène Le Borgne, working uh, at the Directorate General for Research and Innovation of the European Commission, looking more specifically into funding for rare disease research. 
And previously, I used to work for DG Santé in their team, which has set up the European Reference Network. Happy to probably answer more on the EU-funded research uh, schemes, but whatever is relevant, I'm happy to, to support. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. And you've already met uh, Christina and Virginie. And we're also joined here by Alexandra Ganev, who's going to support with the Slido. And you see the Slido um, code on your screens now and the passcode, which is U Y U R E G F. So please do feel free to sign on and put your questions in Slido as well. Uh, I'm just checking then. I think we had a hand raised. So uh, I see Javier. Do you want to take the floor and ask your question, please? Do you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Okay. Um, maybe I don't know if, if it's a question. Uh, it's a question rather to the prior presenter, and not uh, because I, I want to see something more in the in the more kind of big picture of of the activity of Emma. And I wonder if there there is already uh, in in the public domain some sort of statistics as to the split of the consultations by therapeutic area to understand really. Where are the, I mean, because we know the epidemiology, we know where the, where the rare disease sits in terms of which of those are you know, enzymatic, whatever, but we, we have a little bit less visibility of the efforts of the industry in the sense, are they balanced versus where, where they are the, the key areas? And do you have something like a split of consultations by therapeutic area or by type, I mean, genetic diseases versus enzymatic, whatever. I mean, is there anything more on this, I mean, past activity? Yeah, thank and, you. And, and, Sorry, and have... I think for, for Virginia, I think I think uh, Virginia Hebert, uh, is she still online? Yeah, thank you, Javier. Yeah, indeed. I mean, certainly at the EMA, we publish um, annual statistics in our annual report and our annual activity report. So you could certainly find some information there. Um, Maria, did you want to make a comment? Oh, you put the link to the annual report. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Virginie, did you want to comment on, on Javier's question? No, thank you. I was going to re redirect to you, actually, because I think like uh, most of the analyses that we use uh, basically are coming from uh, the EMA in terms of uh, where are the trends for fund designation, where are the trends for uh, market authorization. Then there are like some... Um, other analyses, but most of the time that are not accessible to us because they are done by private companies, so we don't necessarily ourselves have access. This said, in the context of the RADIS 2034 size study, we have tried to make projection, and mostly that's a, a trend that we also see is that more or less often the development are coming in um, kind of uh, low-hanging fruit type of uh, development and that's why we are saying like uh, here now we really need a, an impulsion into the diseases that have no therapeutic um, option at the moment and sometimes that do not even have a basic research. So that's where here we have and I will not go too much into the advocacy part of our work but we need a combination between the regulation that might encourage developers in those areas, and we need also uh, some efforts from the uh, public funding in order to also elicit some of the knowledge in the disease that are really at the moment not known at all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Virginie. And thank if you, Javi. Um, compliment, sorry. For yes, the please go ahead, ahead, Helen, please. Thank you. No, I just would like to, to compliment what Virginie was saying by explaining that now what we are trying to do with the research funding at EU level is also to group disease so that sometimes the ultra rare will benefit a bit from the same disease of the same with the same etiology or mechanism possibly to try to have let's say a few more disease benefiting from the funding so trying to group it's not an easy task as you can imagine but yeah we are trying to encourage in that way i stop here yeah, thank you. Very important to highlight indeed. And also that in, we have a public register with orphan designations and orphan marketing authorizations. So that the full information is there and summaries in our annual report, which we've pasted into the chat. Okay. I'm I was thinking about the consultations split. I mean, um, the, in that consultations chart that they show, visual, is it 
like when, when you have these interactions that are aiming to you know, uh, uh, align on the on the on the design of the trial or something like that is there something that you typically publish uh, anonymized or at least on um, yeah by big map i mean by size of the of the marketer or, or the company by a thematic area by something in that specific area of activity was so i guess this is you're referring to scientific advice requests uh yes and yes yeah we do publish we do publish actually in the annual report uh, a breakdown by therapeutic area i don't think i'm not sure if in the activity report we specifically uh you know uh, show the, the 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 numbers or the trends uh you know separately for scientific advice versus protocol assistance i i wouldn't actually think so uh, but yeah there is a breakdown of overall scientific advice uh, and protocol assistance by therapeutic area uh, and you know roughly uh, protocol assistance is about I don't know uh, 10 15 up to 20 percent depending on the year of uh, the total of scientific advice uh, you know requests excellent thank yeah. you I'm sorry I, I, I forgot my affiliation is Javier Martinez from Amilai thank you Okay, thank you. We're going to move on. Then I have another hand raised um, in the room. So, Krishan, would you like to take the floor and, and raise your question, please? Can you, we can, are you, are you speaking, Christian? Mike? We can't hear you. No, I, maybe we'll come back to you, Christian. Um, then we, we have another hand raised, Nafaro. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Loud and clear, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, now I want to get back to the question because I, I had a question ready. I mean that uh, a big amount, like uh, how come that only the few rare diseases within the biggest percentage of the population are of interest in research? Uh, and then, of course, hence proper medication becomes available for them, which this means that even a bigger percentage of the population is being left in the cold, as all of the others together represent most probably a hundredfold more patients than the percentage of the main rare disease within a certain category. For example, I'd say, um, let's take rheumatic diseases, rheumatic arthritis comes out, and all the rest of the 200 different kinds drop out how come yeah thank you for the question i'm i'm, I'm going to ask violetta who's chair of the comp just to talk about the distinction between designation and and what the incentives that are offered through that are and then i'll give the floor back to ellen to talk about uh funding for research over to you Vila. thank you very much so if i understood your question correctly you are wondering why there is there are so many very rare diseases where there is no development. And I think you are referring to one of the slides of Virginie. Now, of course, um, you have to think about the fact that patients with a rare disease for which the pathophysiology uh, and genetics is well known is much easier as a target for drug development than a disease where there is no knowledge about the disease. So that could be one explanation. But also coming to the incentives, I think I will refer to Helene because um, maybe you can explain how the applications for grant support are distributed or what is coming in actually for you. Yeah, well, uh, maybe I will just step, take a step back as well. Um, as you were saying, uh, Violetta, I think if you have already uh, some research on a disease, it will prepare the path for all the rest. So it's it's sort of natural. Now, what we are trying to do at EU level is to, on one hand, have collaborative projects working on some disease, group of disease, and there it's very competitive. So it, of course, it might be that uh, diseases which are better known will be uh, more successful indeed. 
But there is also another big frame where we are trying to build the rare disease research ecosystem, including with patients. So for example, Eurodis is very much involved in, in many of these projects. And one is, for example, the European Joint Program co founded on Rare Disease, where we are trying to support the whole community. So it's not about drug development itself, but it's also about all different stages of, of research and trying to um, train researchers, train clinicians, train patients to work together in rare disease research, and that will enhance the whole ecosystem. So I, I don't want you to leave this webinar thinking that we leave the ultra rare behind. At the contrary, they are at the core and the focus of our EU funding thinking and work hand in hand with uh, with uh, Eurodis and all patients association and, and researchers. I mean, clinicians and patients are key drivers there. Uh, we have also different schemes. We have also public-private funding schemes uh, um, under the Innovative Health Initiative, for example, where we work with industry because, I mean, the field of rare disease is so complex that nobody alone has a solution for all rare disease. So we need foundations, we need industry, we need SMEs, and through the different schemes, we have different tools to leverage. That would be a quite general answer, but be be sure that we try to maximize all the different types of tools we use. And I, I, maybe Virginie, you want to complement? Yes, thank you. But in the end, there are less doctors as well available for the rest of the group. Okay. So maybe then I could I could also expand a bit on the work of the European reference networks because these networks were created exactly for helping the people. I mean the patients not having to travel, but benefiting from the knowledge of other experts in other countries. So, for example, you have an expert in a rare disease at the other end of Europe, and it would be good if the knowledge from the doctor travels and look at the cases of the patient in another country. And that's the reasoning behind the European Reference Network. And I'm sure there are many ERN representatives here with you today. They are still young. They were established in 2016, 17, but uh, the, some have uh, rich, uh, research history uh, um, and they will certainly further expand. So we are not living in a perfect world, of course, so I'm not telling you we have already the solution for all disease, but we are trying to tackle this. Thank you, Helen. Okay, I might, I might consult that. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Okay, we're going to have another try with Krishan in the room. Do you want to try and take the microphone and raise your comment or question, Krishan? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so, sorry about that. Um, I, I just had a, a question with regards to a uh, similar framework to what FDA has with regards to breakthrough and more recently the START uh, pilot program that they've uh, initiated. Is there any frameworks that the agency is considering to allow more frequent dialogue with CHMP and COMP to uh, facilitate speeding up the development of orphan rare diseases beyond beyond prime um i'll, I'll pass the the question to your danis who can provide um some background on we have prime we have itf for example we have um, so in, in Europe, we have uh, uh, something which is similar, but not exactly the same as the breakthrough designation of FDA, and that's the prime designation that was mentioned. Now, this is not specific to uh, orphan medicinal products. It's for all, you know, products that have, uh, you know, uh, uh, promise. It's uh, Prime stands for, for prior, stands for priority medicine, so products that show, like, uh, you know, promising uh, uh, early results. Um, and this is a way to interact, uh, not so much with the prom with the comp, mainly with the CHMP, because this is uh, meant to be also um, uh, for products that are in early stages of uh, clinical development. So we we have some kind of um, uh, demonstration of of you know uh, benefit in 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 early clinical development. Although for SMEs, it's also possible to to get the designation at an earlier stage, so at the non clinical. Uh, you know, stage. Um, of course, you know, on the FDA side, there's much, uh, you know, higher, bigger variety of, you know, early support mechanisms. We don't have that variety uh, in Europe, but uh, yeah, we're trying our best. And also, uh, hopefully, we'll see prime codified also in legislation in, uh, you know, a few years. So this is um, now, it will become more than a, an EMA initiative. It will become, uh, you know, part of the, um, the legal tools available for, for early support. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Adonis. And perhaps also to mention, we do have a dedicated uh, structure for SMEs. So we have an SME office. And if you're 
unsure about um, how to navigate the EU regulatory system or it's your first time, uh, colleagues there will take you uh, step by step uh, through the process and offer support along the development cycle. So that's very important to, to bear in mind. And we can send you in the chat more details on that as well. Okay, I see another question in the chat from Sylvia, and then we're going to flip over to the Slido. Um, so, Sylvia? Okay. Okay, um, I'm Sylvia Guerrero. I'm from Perre International uh, in Barcelona. I have a more technical kind of question that is about the significant benefit. As, as you know, it's quite the... A difficult step if, if it's, there's no drug for a pathology, no, because you, know, you don't have anything to compare. But if there are some drugs that they are completely effective, what are your recommendations? Because sometimes uh, we, we see that it's hard to demonstrate this significant benefit because uh, you don't have designed the trial uh, taking into account this, then you have to go to an direct comparison that always is very difficult for for IMA to find robust this comparison. And on the other hand, another aspect that is that also we, uh, if an, another asset is in development and it arrives before before you, you also to have to to demonstrate significant benefit versus that one. And in that case, it's impossible to include in that in the trial. What will be your recommendations in order to have a successful, significant benefit uh, at, the, at the maintenance and the marketing authorization process? I give that to Violetta. Would you like to answer? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I think there isn't a very single and straightforward word answer to this question because it of course depends very much on the disease and what is already available for the treatment of patients with the specific disease. Of course we are very well aware that direct comparisons with some medicinal products which have been approved very recently before the one you are applying for could be very difficult or almost impossible. Therefore, there are different other ways to support a claim for significant benefit, and that could be by performing indirect comparisons. And that's one of the reasons why we also have a methodologist on the panel who can go into more uh, methodological aspects of that. But of course, um, the most important is to think in which aspects or what are the claims that you have for your own medicinal product that it is in some way providing a significant benefit for the patients with the same disease. To discuss more details, I think the best way would be to come for protocol assistance. As it was already mentioned, there is the opportunity to ask specifically a question, how can I defend my significant benefit? And the answer will come from the Committee for Orphan Medicinal Products in coordination, of course, with the Scientific Advice Working Party and with the rest of the questions of this advice. And therefore, you could receive a tailor-made, up-to-date answer to, to the question according to the specific situation. Thank you, Violetta. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, I'm looking to Alexandra now and Slido. And thank you for all of those who've entered questions on Slido. So, Alexander, would you like to read some questions out? Of course. So here are two related questions. How do you make sure the views of the patients affected by the conditions are represented during the evaluations? And also, how exactly can patient associations interact with the CHMP? Maria, would you like to kick off? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. So we have, as I said, the... Um, the team, which is public and stakeholder engagement team at EMA, which was created specifically to ensure that the voice of stakeholders is included in different uh, regulatory processes. And we have a very large network of patient and consumer organizations that we work with, as well as healthcare professional organizations. But if we stick with the patient organizations, they fulfill a certain eligibility criteria. Everything's published on our website and we interact with these organizations quite extensively through different ways. So we reach out through these organizations to identify 
individual patients who are living with a condition, and then we interact with our colleagues internally to ensure that their voices are included in different activities. Now, I've put in the chat of the WebEx an article that we published uh, using scientific advice as a case study where we showed the added value and the impact of including patients in scientific advice. But we have a lot of other examples, and I've included also a link to the stakeholder engagement reports where you can see uh, lots of different ways that we engage with our stakeholders and ensure that they have a voice uh, during uh, the evaluation of medicines that concern them directly. And for the second question, um, I think they were combined. Okay, so all of the information has been linked into the WebEx chat. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Maria. Uh, another question from Slido, please, Alexandra. This one is addressed to Dr. Framke. Would you be able to suggest any reference? Are there any workshops planned on innovative trial designs, for example, testing potential new drug candidates addressing same metabolic pathway? Okay, um, I can think of, in terms of workshops, um, I remember a recent workshop um, that was related to the ACT-EU framework on um, methodology that took place last year at the EMA not specifically for metabolic pathways, but in general for um, innovative trial designs. Um, EMA is also, or let's say, colleagues of mine are also going on a regular basis to um, workshops with, um, let's say, um, um, scientific um, organizations. And um, uh, yeah, that's also for, yeah, um, for innovative designs. Um, uh, there are also, uh, let's say, publications we are working on um, guidance documents. Um, one guidance document was joined efforts by um, EMA, HMA, and the European Commission, and it was it's a Q and A document on um, uh, complex trials that was um, published in 2022. Um, we are currently working on a um, reflection paper on um, platform trials, um, so that will be published um, in the future, that's um, under development. Um, so there are, let's say, on a more general level about um, innovations and trial designs, there are ongoing activities. Um, however, I cannot answer this specific, specific one to um, metabolic, I think, um, issues. Yeah, thank you, Theodore. I think that was, that was very helpful. Um, Okay, maybe another question from Slido. And please do remember, you can also put your hand up in the virtual meeting room if you'd like to, to raise a question directly. This question is asking about clarifications uh, between the difference of scientific advice and protocol assistant. Mm -hmm. So does protocol advice mean that it is a scientific advice for all from designation? So effectively, yes, that's the that's the difference. So uh, protocol assistance is just a, a special name that we use for scientific advice on orphan products. Are there any differences really between uh, between the two in terms of the scope? No. So you can ask any question related to drug development uh, for a non-orphan drug as part of scientific advice for orphan drugs as part of uh, protocol assistance. Um, Protocol assistance, I would say, uh, would tend to be a little bit more challenging for us. Not because you know, uh, because uh, you know, effectively, you know, drug development in a rare disease is difficult, right? You know, it's difficult to run trials. You know, particularly comparative, uh, you know, trials. Also, knowledge about orphan conditions is often relatively uh, more restricted. So, this would be situations where we would particularly seek out uh, patient uh, involvement, but also engagement of external experts, experts on the disease, which, you know, under normal conditions may be not be part of our, uh, you know, assessment, uh, you know, teams. Uh, and of course, and the other thing about protocol assistance and, and you know, uh, development in rare, in rare disease is that uh, also because of the rarity, regulatory guidance is lacking. And this is, you know, uh, um, um, a very nice use case where, you know, scientific advice is particularly helpful because if you can understand or know or find out what the regulatory requirements are, you know, for a disease through uh, a guidance, then maybe there's a less need, you know, to come for, for scientific advice. So 
uh, particularly helpful, I would I would think, is protocol assistance. But otherwise, there's like little differences between uh, between the two. Uh, the other um, important thing to note is that in protocol assistance, uh, you can also come and ask questions about significant benefit, which then uh, our colleagues at the COMP, uh, the Committee of Oral Medicinal Products, will uh, will address. Which of course is simply not applicable to the scientific advice. Thank you. Thank you, Iodanis. Okay, we're going to turn back to the virtual meeting room. Uh, Luca, would you like to raise your question? Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for the presentation and uh, for the good work you guys do. Um, you know, the registration uh, process is a centralized one, but the access to patients, so price and reimbursement, uh, is, is not in the end uh, the proof of the pudding. Uh, comes to uh, facilitating the access of innovative drugs to patients. Um, so while there is a lot of innovation and you guys are doing a great work, what can we do in Europe in order to uh, accelerate after the approval, the readily access of new drugs to patients? I you guess I can, I can give it a go. I mean, uh, you're obviously, you know, uh, perfectly right that, you know, things are not as centralized, uh, uh, you know, during the, the whole, uh, you know, development authorization and life cycle management of, of drugs as they potentially should be. Um, we can all appreciate that, you know, decisions about, you know, pricing, reimbursement, uh, and all of these things are uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, sensitive politically. And uh, th that's why there's, you know, difficulties in, in uh, you know, coming to kind of a, a common understanding or a common voice uh, across Europe. There are things and, and strides being made. So we have, for example, the, uh, the new regulation for health technology assessment, uh, you know, coming into force. Uh, early next year, so in January of 2025, and um, yeah, at least in terms of the uh, this health technology assessment aspect, which is uh, really a discussion about um, the effectiveness, not just the uh, efficacy, so the, the benefit of a drug uh, shown in uh, clinical trials, which is a bit a bit of a um, you know artificial, so to speak, environment. is It's, it's really a, um, you know an experiment, but in real world, but also the cost effectiveness. So how does this uh, treatment, for example, compare to other available treatments for the same uh, you know disease? So that part of the uh, of the um, you know considerations that follow uh, and the decision making that follows, you know, the the formal regulatory approval. Uh, of the drug, the marketing authorization of the drug, these things will start, uh, you know, getting a bit centralized. There's still a very long, uh, you know, way to um, reach, you know, even like, uh, you know, common discussions, you know, at the kind of payer, uh, you know, level or payment payment level across Europe. But, uh, but yeah, we're slowly but certainly moving in, in the right direction, I would, I would hope. Yeah, thanks, Yodanis. And, and indeed, a lot of a lot has it been achieved over the years in collaborating, especially on, on the scientific advice space. And now we have this very welcome uh, regulation that will start to be implemented in a phased approach from next year. OK, uh, we move on then. We have another hand raised in the room. Uh, Ven, would you like to raise your comment or question? Sure. Thanks so much for the opportunity. This is a uh, gate uh, meeting and uh, there is a lot of useful information for the drug developers, especially the SMEs. And I have a specific question in terms of the products uh, that have ongoing clinical trials that are not approved in EU or elsewhere. And uh, with previous attempts failed to get the orphan drug designation. You know, this is a big, big thing for an SME, like, you know, like a lot of us. Uh, and my question is, can the sponsor reapply? I, I assume we can with more supportive data. And what are some of the important considerations to be successful uh, for the SME companies to, to successfully achieve the orphan designation in Europe? Christina, would you like to answer that one, please? Thank you for the question. Yes, thank you. It is absolutely possible to come back and ask for orphan designation again. It can be for exactly the same product, exactly the same condition. Uh, what usually happens, as you may be aware, is uh, if the committee thinks that there is not just enough information yet for the, um, to approve uh, and uh, give a positive opinion towards an orphan designation, usually it's because there is a little bit of limited data at the time for designation. 
And uh, in generally, sponsors will then choose to withdraw their application, but they can come back at any time point. Uh, and we see that quite frequently. So if someone who has uh, initially asked for orphan designation, withdrawn it, then come back maybe half a year later when more information is available. So absolutely, you can come back as many times as you like, actually. And indeed, the, the colleagues here at EMA will, will provide you with feedback and, and will give you some advice on what would be required to, to, to file the submission a, a second time. Um, equally, I think you mentioned SMEs, and in, indeed, if, if an SME is thinking of um, approaching the agency to file for orphan designation uh, and they're not sure about how to do it, again, the SME office can set up a briefing meeting, and that, that might be a, a good entry door to start with if you're unsure. Yeah. And, so yes, maybe we should mention as well that there are pre-submission meetings possible for orphan designation uh, procedures as well. So uh, you submit a draft package and then you will have a discussion with uh, me or my colleagues to see whether the package is uh, suitable for, uh, um, yeah, for, for the committee to make an assessment. Uh, and I think those are, personally, I think those are very useful meetings. Uh. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we have another question from Juliana. Would you like to take the floor, please, Juliana? Yes. Hi, everybody. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, so you mentioned during the presentation that uh, the very rare diseases are priority for you. And um, we are an SME working on personalized cancer vaccines, which is uh, patient-specific and tumor agnostic, therefore very well uh, suitable for, for very rare cancer, for the treatment of very rare uh, cancers. But I think that your present tools that you have is just not suitable uh, in the orphan designations for, for, for applying for very rare diseases because just imagine you have to, to first of all justify the condition. The condition for two patients described, it is, you know, would be very difficult uh, to, to, to have this justification. In addition, that we have to, you have to provide plausible evidence that for that particular a condition which is a very rare disease, uh, your uh, your uh, or my uh, treatment would be likely beneficial and uh, safe. So uh, I would like to ask, how do you uh, envision to in and in addition? Of course, I, I have to in, uh, um, explain all of this to the founders who do not believe that anything can go through and do not believe that anybody can make uh, money on very rare disease. Now, but so I, I would like to ask you, how do you want to attract or what is your strategy to attract any companies or, or somebody to develop uh, uh, this kind of medicines for very rare diseases or alternatively, since we have a technology which is cancer agnostic and patient specific, who can we go ahead to apply this for very rare diseases? So I, th I think the question that you're, you're raising then relates with the particular challenges um, for ultra rare diseases for applying for designation. And the incentives were as presented by Christina on the slide, and that, that's how we attract sponsors to, to hopefully apply. Uh, for for orphan designation, but would it, somebody want to, uh, Violetta or Christina, would you like to talk about um, perhaps pre-submission? I can start, and maybe Christina, you can complete me. Um, this problem which you have just described, I think, is quite well understood, and. Um, it's an emerging topic because we have not only in the oncological. Uh, space, but also in other very rare, ultra rare diseases, almost individual personalized treatments. And of course, the question is who and how can we encourage drug development there? So there are several initiatives on 
European, but also even on international level, on global level, to try to find ways to um, end flexibility in the systems that we have in place to enable development in such cases. I don't have a very concrete and specific answer to your question how we can do that today, but I can at least confirm that the problem is well recognized and understood because it goes not only for uh, vaccines, it also is for N is one trials, as we call them, for specific antisensor oligonucleotides targeting a specific mutation that is only detected in one patient. So the production will be for one patient. And therefore, we are thinking uh, with colleagues also from other uh, agencies how to tackle this problem and to attract development in this space. Thank you, so thank you very much. But uh, this, I really appreciate that you are thinking, but I am in this situation and I am not on the only one. And I am just wondering whether you would have any other way to help us, at, especially, you know, with some kind of letter to support or development uh, ideas or, or uh, because the, I asked from the SME office, <laughs> you know, something like this, and I they cannot uh, give us any opinion about uh, about uh, which we can share with our uh, Juliana I, I think probably the, the starting point or the best the best way forward would be to to contact us uh, through the orphan office and set up a pre-submission dialogue or a phone call and we can clarify because it's very difficult to talk about specific cases but we would be happy to help you offline Thank I can you. just oh, complement, done. it's Ellen talking, we are preparing the future partnership on rare disease, which will be a co-fund between member states and the commission, and where one work package will look at an N of one cases, to have a frame for such cases. So I cannot tell you which disease will be covered there and so on, It's the grant is not yet even signed. But as Violetta was saying, the problem is identified and we are trying to develop tools to support there. Uh, maybe, you, yeah, and maybe of relevance here, we should mention, uh, well, for now, tentative provisions in the new pharmaceutical legislation about platform technologies, because if you're talking, if you're really talking about like a, a, an N of one disease, then, you know, the whole development, you know, finishes when that one per, uh, person is, is treated. But I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, you're referring more to because uh, you talked about, you know, uh, personalized cancer vaccines and things like this, that you're more referring, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, a platform technology, because that's not like a specific, you know, medicinal product. It differs, you know, from, from patient to patient. And, uh, yeah, there are thoughts and considerations about how this could be, uh, you know, regulated in the future with potentially less, because if you're talking uh, platform, right, technology, less stringency at the definition of the, you know, specific, uh, you know, uh, active substance, and maybe, uh, you know, a framework that may allow uh, you know regulation of these of these technologies at the, at the kind of general level so th to be to be continued and to be seen uh, you know with the provisions of the of the new legislation uh, and well, I, maybe, I really uh, yeah. appreciate that but I will die when it, this will come to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to, to enforce in this platform technology I was told earliest 2027 yeah so uh, i should mention also here that uh, uh, at least you know at, uh, for in terms of marketing authorizations there have been uh, a tumor and specifically in the area of cancer tumor agnostic uh, you know indications but we have to remember or keep in mind you know what are the conditions for for such an indication you need to have really uh, what we call a driver mutation so you need you need to understand very well and very comprehensively the mechanism of disease so as to be able to, with just me mechanistical uh, kind of rationale, uh, uh, be convinced, not, not as a regulator, but also as a drug developer, that this, you know, that you can predict that giving this uh, vaccine or this medicine, you know, to the patient, you will have uh, an effect. And that's a very difficult, uh, you know, threshold to, to achieve, huh? because uh, humans and 
all living uh, uh, you know creatures were complicated uh, systems were not you know that that simple so that's where the the pro it's effectively a scientific uh, problem uh, you know uh, more than everything else but yeah there have been uh, strides in that uh, you know direction in cases where indeed uh, uh, that kind of you know mechanistic rationale was like strong enough to overcome uh, you know any uncertainty and any kind of you know need that okay we need to really have like a, a control a you know a statistical test a control kind of uh, you know uh, experiment uh, or you know a very well controlled experiment okay thank you Jordanis, and i thank you again for the question juliana Okay, I'm looking at the clock and we're going to, to spend a, a few more minutes, um, perhaps run a little bit over time simply because of the technical issues that we had. So I'm going to go back to a few more questions from Slido and then we'll have a few more from the room and then we'll have to wrap up. So please, Alexandra. Question for Dr. Rico Salas. Are there any insights on the engagement from SMEs and academia in the development of, of orphan medicines? It can be overwhelming for academia to pursue development. Yes, indeed. Thank you for the question. It is a, a overwhelming for academia, and that's why we are trying to put in place special tools for academic developers. Uh, you can contact us at a specific contact point. I will write it in the chat. Academia at IMA uh, at Europa. Dot, uh, EU, and you could just yes, very like uh, the SME office. You could request for a briefing meeting uh, interaction where we would guide you. We would uh, uh, understand at what point of development you are and what is your situation, and try to um, guide you through your development strategy. We are also trying to. Uh, put in place special incentives for academics. Um, they may come with the new uh, pharmaceutical regulation uh, in this active work in this regard, actually. Uh, for the moment, uh, the orphan designation would uh, actually provide you with uh, very good incentives for development. You, you would have uh, uh, free of charge uh, scientific advice and um, uh, you could start by there, but uh, yeah, please write to us and we will study your particular case. And uh, we don't have a mechanism to put you in contact with SMEs for further development, um, but uh, we would certainly uh, try to help you in uh, gathering the best possible data so you, your, your transferring efforts are optimized. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Maribel. Indeed, there is a lot of support on offer for academics, so, so please do reach out to us. Okay, maybe two more quick questions from Slido, and then we'll go back to the room before we wrap up. Are informal interactions by email possible before the orphan designation submission? Yes, absolutely. They, you can contact us at any stage. And another one, are orphan drug designation parallel evaluations by EMA and FDA possible in a structured procedure? Christina, do you want to answer that? Parallel evaluation, if we're now thinking that this means uh, marketing authorization stage, uh, we do have two legislative, different legislative frameworks. Uh, of course, if an applicant uh, submits the application at the same time, the processes may run in parallel. And uh, together with the FDA, we have a lot of uh, common points, commonalities. We have clusters who meet on a regular basis and discuss uh, development. Uh, so we have one, for example, on rare diseases, where we can bring up specific uh, marketing authorization procedures on rare diseases where maybe there is a challenge, uh, maybe it's a difficult endpoint, maybe the results of the studies are, are not conclusive enough, etc. So there are a lot of possibilities for the two agencies to uh, interact uh, during assessment, before assessment, and actually after assessment as well. However, the actual decision of uh, so the, the final decision is taken individually. So one in the European Union and one in the United States by the FDA. 
Okay, thank you, Christina. I think we had one question in the room. Uh, actually, I think that the hand has gone down. Uh, maybe we will go go to the the chat in this case. Um, Are they going to ask it for, or you will answer it? Yeah. No, in, indeed. I just wanted to, to flag that we, we have had a lot of questions in writing, on both on Slido and in the chat, and um, we, we are running short of time, so please do be reassured that we will answer your questions in writing, and these will be published post-meeting, so we will get the opportunity to answer all the questions if, if we don't have time to do so. Um, I have one hand raised still um, in the room. Uh, please take the floor and ask your question. Yes, can I? Please go ahead. Ja tom kirio gravani bolo na tapos alinika. Ne. Echete, echete, borde, de borde na mili staglika. Όχι. Ναι, εντάξει, μπορώ, αλλά θέλω να μάθω κάτι, κάτι ε, για την Ελλάδα, ε, για αυτόν τον λόγο. Για την Ελλάδα συγκεκριμένα, ε, ίσως... <laughs> ναι, συγκεκριμένα, δηλαδή μου είπανε ότι υπάρχουν πέρα από τα σύνορα α, άλλα άτομα που έχουν την ίδια πάθηση και με ποιον τρόπο μπορώ να συνεννοηθώ μαζί τους. So... Αυτό αναρωτιέμαι, στην Ελλάδα αυτή τη φορά. Αν μπορείτε να κάνετε εσεί τη μετάφραση, σα παρακαλώ. Ναι, βεβαίω. Ε, εννοείται στην Ελλάδα άτομα ή στην Ευρώπη. Στην Ευρώπη. Ναι, αλλά αν γίνεται και στην Ελλάδα, θα είναι. Μάλιστα. So the question is whether uh, so, uh, a patient you know, with a rare disease in Greece or anywhere uh, really, uh, uh, how they can get in touch with other patients having the same disease, either within their country or uh, you know, across Europe. That's actually um, a very nice question to end on, and maybe Virginie yes. can answer it, yes. and then we can translate it off offline. Θέλετε να σας το μεταφράσουμε την απάντηση; Να αγίνα τον εύκανσο πάρα πολύ. Βεβαίως. Okay, so if Virginie, yeah, and I can, I can do the Virginie, translation. Virginie, do you want to answer that? Could you just repeat, please, because I was a bit yeah. lost. Uh, so the question is, how can a patient with a rare disease get in touch with other patients with the same disease, either within their own country or other European countries? But The primary interest would be, I guess, in, within the same country, you know, for ease of uh, communication and access. Okay, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for for translating as well. Uh, yeah, so th there are Rare Disease Alliance uh, in each country of Europe. Uh, you can find the the, um, the contact uh, from all these alliance on the Eurodis website if that's easier. Uh, there are also federation, European federation, that are in that case not national but uh, pan-European on more specific diseases. And in any case, on the Eurodis website, which I can put also in the chat, you can type your disease and then it will show uh, which uh, association, uh, which patient organization you can reach. Okay, yeah, maybe a quick, quick translation. So, υπάρχουν ε, 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 οργανώσεις ασθενών ε, στι, ε, και σε εθνικό επίπεδο αλλά και σε ευρωπαϊκό επίπεδο και υπάρχει ευρω, ε, μια ευρωπαϊκή, ε, τι θα πούμε τι είναι Μαρία, το Eurordis ε, οργανισμός, ε, ένας ευρωπαϊκός οργανισμός λέγεται Eurordis, η κυρία Βιρζινή η οποία μόλις απάντησε ε, είναι από αυτόν εκπρόσωπος αυτού του οργανισμού. Ε, μπορείτε να πάτε στην ιστοσελίδα στην οποία θα τη βάλει στο chat ε, και μπορείτε εκεί πέρα να, να βάλετε την πάθησή σας στα αγγλικά ε, και θα σας δείξει ε, ε, οργανώσεις ασθενών ε, σε όλη την Ευρώπη που μπορεί να είναι δηλαδή σε οποιαδήποτε χώρα ή και πανευρωπαϊκή γιατί υπάρχουν και εθνικοί, υπάρχουν όμως και ευρωπαϊκοί τέτοιοι οργανισμοί και μπορείτε μετά να έρθετε σε, σε επαφή ε, μαζί τους μέσω της ειδικής ιστοσελίδας του καθενό. Μάλιστα, ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Με nice. συγχωρείτε. Να nice. είστε <laughs> καλά. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Γεια σας. Yeah, okay. Thank you. We're going to have one last question uh, from Lucia and then we will, will wrap up the meeting. So, Lucia, please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question concerning the type of data that should be submitted for obtaining the orphan graph designation, because we know that it, uh, valid animal models are mentioned as uh, supportive uh, data. 
but we know that not all the orphan drug, uh, the orphan uh, disease have a valid uh, animal model. So my question is, if in this case uh, some in vitro data may be submitted, uh, probably together with a rational uh, justification supporting uh, the the predicted uh, efficacy. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think it's a very good one. So Violetta. Thank you for the question. So, of course, in principle, in vitro data is much more um, difficult to translate directly to humans. And that's why the preference is for at least in vivo data in a valid model for the condition. We know that not every disease has a valid model. Some have several, of course, but uh, it, it depends very much. So, the short answer to the question is, the assessment is case-by-case case basis, if the evidence is sufficient to demonstrate an assumption for efficacy, which can be expected to be uh, reproduced also when applied to uh, patients, then in vitro data might be sufficient. It belongs to the exceptions to the rule. If we look at our statistics, I think we have very few orphan designations which have ended with a positive opinion based on in vitro data only, the reason being that it is very difficult to predict whether this will translate uh, into patients. I hope this answers your question. Perfectly. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank you, Violetta. Okay, I think we're going to have to close um, looking at the, the clock. So uh, thank you very much for, for raising the questions. Also, um, to confirm that indeed I think the slides will be published and we will provide written responses and those will also be published. Um, so I'd give the floor then to Christina to, to close the meeting and thank you everybody for your participation. Yes, I really want to thank everybody online, uh, the people who have been willing to ask questions, put on the camera and engage. I also want to uh, thank the, the panel, everybody who has been engaged and involved. And I think the, the big interest uh, for this was uh, really heartwarming and uh, we will definitely try and uh, do this again because of this big interest. And there was also so many questions. And as already said, we're going to publish uh, all the uh, questions and with uh, answers to those, of course, um, the presentations will be online. This has been recorded, so that will also be put online. And so if you need to go back, you can do that in the future. Um, I do hope that you leave this meeting with uh, a better understanding of the benefits of the orphan designation and how to apply for it. And uh, I would like you to leave with... Um, sort of the message that applying for orphan designation can indeed be done at a very early stage. It is, I would say, advisable to come early on because then once you have the designation, you have the various incentives open to you. You can engage with us at any stage. And um, yeah, it, it's really, I really hope that you, you know, take this opportunity and, and engage with us in the, in the future. And also that there are so many different contact points, so many colleagues now you have, because you hear, you've seen some of them. And um, we have loads of uh, fantastic colleagues in-house as well who will be happy to engage and uh, talk to you and uh, discuss future developments for rare diseases. So. Thank you, Christina. And we wish you all a good evening and a good afternoon. So thank you very much. Bye-bye.